So if you have your Bibles, we can go and read the Word of God, and we're going to focus on those first uh, 15 verses there. And so this is the Word of God. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household. And he gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw a vision, an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel of the Lord was speaking to him and had left, he summoned two of his servants and and a devout soldier of those who were of his person attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. About, but he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky open up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by the four count corners of the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again the voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And that's the conclusion of the reading of the word. So can you imagine uh, living in in a day, in today's day, totally depraved as we see what's going on? We're just seeing... Like, it, the depravity of man at its finest right now. But can you imagine living in this day and have no hope of, of salvation and no promise of peace in this life or in the future? And what we're seeing today, the murder of millions of babies, idolatry in all forms, sexual immorality, the distortion of marriage and gender and sexual identity are nothing new. Satan has been recycling his old tricks for generations However, there was a time when we would have lived in the filth of our sin and not had hope. And this was the reality for the Gentiles. Not only were the Gentiles in hostility with Israel, but they were enemies of God, separated from the covenant family. They were considered pagans, heathens, unclean. God separated a nation to be a light to the nations. Israel believed in one God and was to be holy and separate because he is holy, as we see in Leviticus 19.2. They were commanded to obey his voice and to keep his covenant so that they could be his own possession among the peoples or the nations. We find that in Exodus 19. In contrast, the Gentiles worshipped many gods. They committed vile acts. They had prostitutes in their temples. They, they sacrificed their babies to their gods similar to what we see today. And the nations were under the influence of Satan. Think about religions we know about, such as Hinduism. We often think of Hinduism as something new, but it actually was founded 2000 B.C. Buddhism was founded 500 B.C. So thousands of years or hundreds of years before the incarnation of Christ, when Christ came to this earth as a man, people were following their sin-bound will And millions were perishing without hope of salvation, completely cut off from God and his covenant. Although Gentiles were dividing, had a dividing wall between them and God, he had a plan to include them in the covenant of grace. The word Gentile actually means in Greek, ethnos, which means ethnicity or ethnic group or nation. Therefore, we find clues in the Old Testament for God's plan for the nations, 
For example, King Solomon's prayer revealed that the door was never closed to the foreigner who wished to serve the Lord. In 1 Kings 8, 41-43, it says, Also concerning the foreigner who is not your people, Israel, when he comes from a far country for your namesake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When, we, he, when he comes and prays toward this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you as do your people Israel. The prophetic words of the Psalms depict the nations gathering to worship the one true God. In Psalms 22, 27 through 28, it says, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation will worship before you. The kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over nations. So God called one nation, his chosen people. However, Isaiah declares that the Lord is, God, is, the, is the God of all peoples. And if they turn to him, they will be saved. We see that in Isaiah 45. Israel's mission was to bring justice, Isaiah 42. And the light to the nations, Isaiah 49. So you can see throughout the Old Testament, God is saying, this is, I've selected this group of people, but there's a hope coming for the nations. It's unfolding before our eyes. The Gospels reveal through Jesus' ministry that he was the light to the Gentiles or the world. Though Jesus directed his work to the Jews, he made it known that the people, that hope has arrived for the Jews and the Gentiles. And he said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, and I bring them, I will, must bring them also. They will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. John 10, 16. So following the resurrection of Jesus, the Great Commission, which says go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, that that word in Greek is actually ethnic groups, in Matthew 28, includes the the nations. Jesus described the final judgment after his return when all nations will be gathered before his glorious throne, and as a shepherd he will separate the sheep from the goats, the elect from the wicked, Matthew 25. In Acts 1.18, Jesus gives this framework in the beginning of the book of Acts of how he's going to build his church. He says it's going to start in Jerusalem, then it's going to go in Judea, then it's going to start in Samaria, until the ends of the earth. Therefore, up to this point, evangelism was focused in these areas, in these, in these communities. But now the time was arriving when Christ would include the nations into his covenant family. This leads us to the historic day when we witness the arrival of salvation to the Gentiles or the nations in the house of Cornelius. So I want you to think of two questions as we're going through these, these verses here. The first I want you to think about as we're talking about this is how did the providence of God orchestrate circumstances in your life to draw you to Christ, saving you from his wrath and condemnation? The second one I want you to think about is how is God calling you to live in complete devotion to his will? So if you look at the first two verses of this chapter, we see on the northern coast of Judea, on the Mediterranean Sea, there's a major city called Caesarea. And now Caesarea was of great importance. It was the seat of the Roman government, and and there was also a Roman centurion named Cornelius. So not only was the city important, so also was this man Cornelius. He was a military man who was over... He ruled over a hundred men. So Cornelius was different from the pagan Gentiles. He was a devout man to God and, and the God of Israel specifically. And his wife and children also shared his commitment. In other words, they were called God fears. You may have heard that term before. And what that basically means is that they believed that there was a one true God. All the other Gentiles believed in multiple gods, they had idols. And yet that's what made Israel unique, is they had one one God, and he believed in that God. And so he went through these steps where he gave alms, he gave offerings, he probably followed some of the regulations, but he was not able to enter into the temple. He He was restricted to the outer courts that was restricted to Gentiles, and he didn't follow through with circumcision either. So we see that he he didn't follow these pagan gods, and he followed these steps. And he had all the right things going for him. 
But every human being has enough light to know there's a, one, there's a true God, but not enough light to save them. That's the case with Cornelius. The, we often hear we see people say, call themselves atheists or agnostic, and Romans 1 says differently. It says every single person knows there's a God. What they actually do is they suppress it, the truth. And that's the reality. Every human being has enough light to know there is that one true God, but yet not enough light to be able to save themselves. They need the gospel. And so what we need to see is a miraculous work of regeneration of the heart. When God takes out your hard heart of stone and gives you this ability to believe. That's why in Ephesians 2 it says, you've been saved by faith and this is not of your own so that no man can boast. And so what we see is that something needed to happen in the life of Cornelius. It wasn't enough just to believe there's one true God. God had to do a work in his heart to raise a spiritually dead man to life. And so Cornelius was fertile ground for the gospel. Just as Jesus explained in the parable of the soils that the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit, Matthew 13. And so Cornelius was, was fertile ground. He was good soil. But the seed of the gospel needed to be planted in his heart. We witness God's providence. And this is something I want you to see throughout this. is God's providence in salvation. We see God's providence in location and person and how God is about to send a messenger. So three in the afternoon, God sought out Cornelius through an angelic vision. A man shining, with shining clothes stands before him. And Cornelius is trembling in awe of this, this shining being before him. And he responds to the angel as if he was directly speaking to God by saying, What is it, Lord? For he knew the angel was just a mere messenger. For this was a message coming from directly from God. This was an example of the sovereign work of salvation. He chooses the individual, not because of anything good in them, but for his own pleasure. Cornelius knew that there was one true God. He knew something was missing in his life. He longed for peace. And he prayed to God, and those prayers were heard. We can probably relate to those moments when we longed for something, and something was missing before we came to know Christ. And those prayers went up to God, and when God fixes his love upon someone, those prayers are like sweet aroma of an offering of sincere desire to be saved from sin, hell, and death. So we look at verses 5 and 6. And we see the purpose of the angel was to provide instructions to, that required obedience. And this is something very important, that the angel came, gave him instructions, and he said, this requires obedience. That's what happens in salvation. He changes your heart, and he requires a human responsibility to react and repent of your sins. Once again, we see God's sovereign will in the salvation of Cornelius. God knew Cornelius before the foundation of the world. He prepared the soil of his heart to be ready for the seed of the gospel. And he planned to send a preacher, Peter, to plant that seed that required obedience. God told him to send some men to Joppa and ask for a man named Simon, a.k.a. Peter, and who was staying at a house along the sea. So not only do we see God's providence in the life of Cornelius, but we also see his perfect uh, his, not, his preparation of the good soil in his heart, but also where Peter was located. Peter was not in Jerusalem. He was 35 miles outside of Caesarea, nestled along the sea on the path to Cornelius. And of all places Peter could reside, he was staying with Simon, a tanner. Now, what a tanner is, is someone who creates leather items. And so you can imagine what's going on inside of this house. They, they, they make packs, they make sandals, they make shoes, they make tents. In order to work with leather, you have to work with dead animals. And so this was the reality of what's going on. The tanners were required to live and reside on the outside of town because the stench of their work was so bad that they wanted the wind of, from, the, from the seashore to take it out the other direction. And so this is no, of no coincidence of where he's located. God told him he's staying at the tanner's house along the sea. 
And so what we see also is that the tanner is someone that is forbidden by Jewish law. And Leviticus 11 gave you rules and regulations of animals that you could not eat and you could eat, and also that you couldn't touch dead animals. So you can imagine this guy who has to make leather and he's killing animals and he's skinning animals and he's got the stench of death on him, that he was an outcast. He was ceremonially unclean and by the Jewish standards. And so here Peter is staying with, of all people, this guy who is ceremonially unclean. And so perhaps God is breaking down the prejudice of, and of the heart of Peter and preparing his heart for the mission that's about to take place. He would be sent in coming days to meet the Gentiles who were ceremonially unclean. But also think about God's providence and location. Simon the Tanner's home was on the edge of town near the sea where Cornelius' men were just so happened to be traveling. And if you were trying to find Simon the Tanner's house and you asked for directions... And all they have to do is say, follow the stench, and you can find his house. So you can see God's providence, even in the little finest details. And so in verses 7 and 8, it says, As soon as the angel departed, there was no delay. Cornelius obeyed. And this is something very important. When God says to do something, to be obedient, and not delay in your reaction to obedience. Actually, delayed obedience is actually disobedience. And so... Cornelius obeyed, and he sent two of his servants and another soldier who was also a God-fearer to find Peter. And when God tells you to do something, we react immediately without delay. Cornelius knew something was happening in his heart. Maybe you can relate to that. Something was happening. I need, there's something going on. There was an expectation. God was calling him, drawing him to the feet of Christ. And so we look at verses 9 through 14. And while Cornelius' men were traveling to find Peter, God was preparing Peter for a mission. So here's the providence of God working in the lives of Cornelius, and now he's working in the life of Peter, and he's preparing Peter for his mission. So to separate his people from the Gentiles, God gave Israel not only Ten Commandments, but 613 commands to obey, including dietary regulations. Jesus summarized the law as having two emphases, love for God and love for neighbors. That's Matthew 22. Israel was to be different from the rest of the world and followed their many, the the rest of the world who were following many gods and their sinful lust, and they were supposed to be different, separated, following one God. And there was all these laws that were to instruct Israel how a holy God requires holiness from his people, and how they should worship him, how they were to treat one another. And so the law was to expose our sinful nature. We knew that we couldn't obey 613 laws. We could never do that perfectly. And so the law was to expose what our sinful nature is, our rebellion against God. And so Peter did not fully comprehend the words of Jesus when he said, It is not what enters the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. That's in Matthew 15, 11. In other words, it's a heart issue. You you had all these regulations of what to eat and not eat and do this and do that, but it's not about all what you're doing, all these obligations. It's about what's in the heart. That's what the law was to show. And so here, Peter, he's thinking that he was a good Jew. He said, I'm better than those pagan Gentiles. I've never eaten anything unclean. But only a few years before, Peter broke Ten Commandments by lying and denying his Savior. James wrote in James 2.10, For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. So Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He obeyed the law perfectly on our behalf, as our substitute, God is removing Peter's focus on his efforts and redirecting it to Jesus Christ. And so Peter is praying in noontime. And while he's on the roof, he becomes hungry. And so while some people are preparing some food for him, he falls into this trance, and the sky opens up, and this object like this great sheet, like this big picnic table coming down from heaven with all these animals 
that were forbidden by God in Leviticus 11. And he says, get up, Peter, and eat it. Kill and eat it. And how did Peter respond? Did he say, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask? No, he actually res- combined two words that we should never say to God. He, he said, by no means, Lord. In other words, he said, no, Lord. He said, Lord, you're my, you're my master. I'm your slave. But no. That's dangerous words to say to God. And so what we see here is that his obedience to the dietary law was more about obligation and tradition rather than devotion and love. And that's the difference between legalism and legalism obeys, but it doesn't adore. It doesn't worship. It's out of obligation. It's another thing when you know the goodness of God in your life and you just want to obey him and live holy and please him because of what he's done. Even though it's You've already earned, you've already gained your salvation. You don't deserve it. And yet you just want to obey him. God was exposing his heart, which was the point of the law. He was reminding him that the Christ is the fulfillment of the law. So that we no longer have to depend on our works, our efforts to be saved, or to even maintain our salvation. We must depend completely on Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Paul said that no one is justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians 2.16. Christ ushered in the new covenant with his church, not only declaring foods to be clean, but also you and I, the Gentiles, the the world, the nations. And in verse 15, Peter is perplexed by this vision. But his eyes are beginning to open. And the men who were sent by Cornelius are at the gate, knocking, the Spirit informs Peter to go and greet them and lets them know that he's, they were sent by him. So something amazing happens here. Peter invites Gentiles, these unclean, ceremonially unclean men, into his house. But he not only does that, but he gives them lodging. He's starting to understand that God is declaring in this vision that what was depicted in the Old Testament that what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. The Jews, thought that, the, the Jews thought that they were saved because of their nationality and their possession of the law. The selection and separation of Israel for the purpose of holiness uh, was to be a light to the nations, but that became perverted by pride. The Jews and Gentiles hated one another. This is something very important to understand when it comes to what Peter's, what's happening with Peter right now. So think about this, that there was so much hatred amongst the Jews and the Gentiles that the Jews thought that God created the Gentiles as fuel for the fire of hell. Some, some Jews that said that, that God, um, that if a, if, a, if a man would marry a Gentile woman, they would actually perform a funeral. That's how much they hated these people. Think about this one. They believed that if, a, that if you walked into a Gentile house or had a Gentile walk into your house, that you became defiled. See, the reality was that, that in this time, Gentile women had many abortions. They would kill their babies, and they would dump the baby in their drains. And so to enter into a house of a Gentile was as if you were walking into a, a house that has been defiled by death. This was the reality of the hatred amongst them, but it was not one-sided. The hatred uh, by the Gentiles also looked at the Jews as slave material. They persecuted and oppressed and murdered them, and they, sought, they thought of them as the enemies of the human race. So here it is, Peter, a Jew, and Cornelius, not too far away, the Gentile, and God is connecting these two together. And he travels with the men to Caesarea, And he enters the home of Cornelius and says, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That's found in verse 28. And he says then, I most certainly understand now that God is not the one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. See, this is the reality of what we're seeing. God's plan was the unfolding from the Old Testament 
and was revealed in the, in the New Testament. B.B. Warfield once said that the Old Testament was like a fully furnished room with the lights dimmed. And now in the New Testament, it's like the light came on through Jesus Christ. And now you see everything that's revealed now. This was my plan. I wanted to separate this group of people to show you what it meant to be holy, what it meant to be outside of grace. And now I'm allowing you into this family to be the received grace so that you can be holy and be saved from my wrath. I'm going to take on your wrath, your punishment on your behalf so you can experience grace that no one can fully comprehend because what is this grace that God who is perfect and holy would come and save wretched sinners who reject him? And yet he does this providentially in the hearts of the people in in your life and he's directing and moving things just like he did with Cornelius to bring you to where he wants to fulfill his plan in your life. This is what we see in the world today. We see all this hatred in the world. And this is nothing new what we're seeing. This is nothing new. The reality is we suppress the truth. We suppress our own hatred, our own prejudices, our own, our own sinfulness. No one likes to talk about sin anymore. And that's what's happening in the world today. We're, it's almost like we're seeing God's common grace just lifting off of humanity to show you, you want to see what you're really like? Here it is. This is what we're seeing happening right now. And so you want to really know what's happening, how the, the, the cure for this. Of course, we try to we do what we can to love our neighbor and to do things that can, that can correct error and all these kind of things. But the gospel is the only solution that really change situations. We cannot change our, our world. We cannot change the hatred and division among men without changing the heart. That's the power of the gospel. Think about this, that a modern missionary was conducting a communion service in Africa. And beside him, there was an elder who was very old. The old man was the chief of the Nagoni tribe by the name of Manly Heart. Cool name. And there was, a, a man, there was many Nagoni in this congregation. And at this communion service, the old chief said that he would remember the days when the young warriors of the Nagoni had gone out to bloody their spears at the expense of other tribes. And they had left a trail of burned and devastated towns and bloodied bodies. And when they returned home, they would leave the blood on their spears as trophies for their killings. And they always dragged the women back as a reward. The missionary recounted the fact that the two tribes that the Nagoni were forever fighting against and slaughtering was the Nisenga and the Tumbuka. And as he looked around, he saw gathered on, at the table of the Lord Jesus Christ the Nagani tribe, the Nasinga, and the Tumbuka. Once passionate for shedding each other's blood, now are one because of the blood of Jesus Christ. They gather not to fight, but they gather to share their love. Somehow, in the great grace of God, all of the barriers had been broken down. All the things which were built on hatred and animosity, all the walls that had been built between these people, which could only be scaled in hatred, we're crushed by love. So think about this as the providence of God in your life. Every one of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all of us have become like those who are unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. And all of us wither like a leaf. And all of our iniquities like wind take us away. However, God says, I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not seek, ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am. Here I am. To a nation which did not call on my name. All humanity, including Israel, were separated by the presence of God. But Christ came and fulfilled the law. He lived perfectly on our behalf and he bore the wrath of God that you and I deserve, tearing down the walls to the Holy of Holies. And the Gentiles were bound to the outer courts of the temple and he crushed the walls to allow them in. But he not only did that, he made every single believer living temples of the Holy Spirit, united by one spirit, under one God, saved by Jesus Christ. Pentecost was not only the inauguration of the new covenant, it was the reversal of Babel. Humanity brought judgment upon themselves. They desired to be sovereign, to self-govern. They desired to be their own gods. And their sin brought divisions of languages, racism and hatred, 
and has caused misunderstanding, confusion, and hatred, hatred amongst ethnicities and nations ever since. Oh, but God decreed that Jesus Christ would come and through the power of the gospel would break down the power of sin. That is the, what the, the speaking of tongues was the, the languages of the nations to proclaim the gospel to the nations. That was the purpose of that. And he unified one people as he confirm, conforms them into his image. So think about these words in Ephesians. Remember that you were at one time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, peace to those who were near, for through him we have both, we both have access to one spirit in the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God and the Spirit. So, I asked the question in the beginning, two questions. First, let's define what providence is. Providence is the sovereign, divine superintendence of all things, guiding them towards their divinely predetermined end in a way that is consistent with their created nature, all to the glory and praise of God. The divine, sovereign, benevolent control of all things by God is the underlying premise of everything that is taught in the scriptures. So the question was, how did the providence of God orchestrate circumstances in your life to draw you to Christ, to save you from his wrath and condemnation? Just think about, just like Cornelius, Cornelius was fertile ground, but he didn't know the gospel. He didn't know Christ. He needed someone to go and to preach to him. And yet all these orchestrated events in his life, a vision, and all these things that led him up to believe in the one true God was all the providence of God. Think about your own life, the times that you made sinful decisions in your life based off of your own sinful will, and you followed these paths, which ended up leading you right back to where you found salvation. The people that he connected you with, people that met, you met in a grocery store that shared a track with you, the person that, you, that shared the gospel with you, The time that your child had a problem with your child, the time someone passed away, the time that you lost your job, all these circumstances that brought you to salvation was not a coincidence. It was not an accident. He knew from the hands of time that he's going to fix his love upon you. He's going to save you. It's decreed. But yet, now the providence of God is fulfilling the blueprints in your life. That is the power of the providence of God in your salvation. From your the heart that he gave you to believe, that changed and bent your will to his will so that you then began to see your sin through his eyes and desired the things of God instead of the things of this world. That's the providence of God in your life. I think about, I got a call this morning, and uh, my, my aunt is in the hospital. And uh, she was at a friend's house last night and was walking down the steps and missed the step and fell down and broke all of her ribs and has bleeding on the brain. She's on a ventilator right now. She's not a believer. If something happens to her right now, she would be lost forever. And I thought about those times when I've desired to share the gospel with her. And there was times I, through writings and things like that, I tried to. But you think about what Cornelius, 
that God didn't need Peter to save Cornelius, but he gave Peter the privilege to be involved in the work of salvation in the life of this man. That he, he called him and he, cha- he sanctified Peter and changed Peter's heart and broke down those barriers and those walls and those, the things that were blocking him from doing what he was called to do, to proclaim the gospel. And he went to his house and proclaimed the gospel and the whole household was saved. And the, from that point on, the gospel reached the nations. It was the obedience of Peter as well to go and to proclaim the gospel. And oftentimes we think about those family members and those people, this person in the grocery store, that there's something that's just calling you to say something to them. But we get scared because we we become ashamed. We become embarrassed. Or we're afraid that we're going to be rejected. And maybe we are going to be rejected. But perhaps that's the seed that God's going to use to draw that person to Christ. Maybe not in front of you. You may never see the results. But at some point you might see that the fruit of that. Maybe in just an eternity when you walk through those gates and you see that person that heard the gospel in some grocery store. It wasn't random. It was God's providence. When I think about my aunt that's in the hospital right now, you begin to recollect those times that you've desired to share the gospel with her every single time that you came together. How many times we've missed out on opportunities. But maybe in his providence, this is God's wake-up call for her. Maybe in his providence, this is the time where he will not only heal her broken body, but also will break, restore her heart. So the question is, how is God calling you to live a life of complete devotion to his will? And will you obey? Or will there be delay? Think about these words. Let me encourage you to take those if-onlys and draw a circle around them. Then label the circle the providence of God. The Christian believes that God is greater than our if-onlys. His providential hand encompasses all, all, all the, the whole of our lives. Not just the good days, but the da- bad days too. We have the, word, we have the word accident in our vocabulary, but God does not. You think about your life and how he brought you here, how he saved you. And now this should provoke you and draw you to, to the feet of Christ, to, especially in these times where we see, and you, you go out in the world and you proclaim the gospel, you'll start seeing the separation between us and the world. But in the midst of that, you see also the fruits of the labor, that he is building his church. The church seems like it's in chaos, it seems like there's division, but he is gathering his his interracial bride, where one day we will have people from every people group, ethnic group, language, nation, gathered at the throne of God for eternity. And that our church should be a reflection of eternity, even in its imperfection, because we're still sinful people, but we should be showing the love of Christ, and the most loving thing you can do is to proclaim the gospel, just as Peter did to Cornelius. You think about in the beginning when we shared about Exodus 19, 5 and 6, it said God declared to them that it would make, him, make them his possession. However, this went be far beyond Israel to include you and I. You look at 1 Peter 2, 9, 2, 9 through 10, and here's this beautiful description of the church. You are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So here you are, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, unified under one God, bound together, knitted together by the Holy Spirit. And it said in Ephesians that you're being fitted together. It's not perfect. We have our differences. We have our moments where we have divisions. But he's sanctifying us and changing us to be a holy temple, built together to be a dwelling of God and the Spirit. 
And for what purpose? To go and to proclaim the excellencies of him. As Hosea once said, you were once not my people, but now you are my people. You were once not my child, but now you are my child. That's the beauty of adoption. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and how it can encourage us, it can move us, it can provoke us, it can shake us from our comfort zones, and it just reminds us who's on the throne. It doesn't matter who the president is, it matters that Christ is king and that you are ruling over all things. You're working all things for our good and for your glory. You use persecution to sanctify us and to change us and to make us holy and to make us more passionate for the gospel and and to have that dividing line that I'm going to stand up for the gospel regardless of the cost. We know that because of your providence and how you use situations and circumstances in our lives to draw us to Christ, that it was not a mistake, it was not coincidence, it was planned out before the hands of time. And that is just pure love and grace to people that are undeserving. So I pray for every single person that you will encourage them. If they feel that they have um, broken your heart and they feel like they've, they don't have assurance of their faith, to know that those who are yours, who are bought with a price, will be kept in your hands and nothing will snatch them out of your hands. Remind them also that time is short. Tomorrow is not promised. And so we need to take advantage of the opportunities to share the love of Christ, the gospel, that is able to save a lost soul and to give them eternal life. Today is the day, not tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.